Swifters, we continue to build the app for the world's best Bitcoin-only Mexican restaurant, that's GuacChain. We learn how to access the Coindesk API using URL session and how to parse the JSON that's returned by creating custom data structures and using JSON decoder. Let's code. We're going to be accessing JSON from the Coindesk API, and we're going to start by looking at the results that the API call will return to us. Now, if you aren't using a browser with a JSON formatter extension, your JSON is going to look ugly. It's going to look like this. It's really tough to read and figure out what's going on. Now, I prefer to use Chrome because at this time when this video is being recorded, there's a really great free JSON formatting extension, which there isn't a comparable one available in Safari for free. So if you don't have a JSON formatter, you can add one to Chrome like I'm about to show you right now. with Chrome Chrome up, not Safari, search for the Google Chrome store, visit the Google Chrome web store. I see that extensions is selected in blue here. Under search the store, I'm going to type in JSON space formatter, press return. There are a few other options that show up, but this one that you see up top has lots of positive reviews. It's free. So I'm going to go ahead and select this one, click add to Chrome, click add extension. You get a message in the upper right that says JSON formatter has been added to Chrome. Nice. And now if I go to my API at Coindesk, you can find this at api.coindesk.com slash v1 slash bpi slash current price dot json all one word all lowercase press return to reload and we see the json is nicely formatted this is going to be much easier to read we get little expansion triangles so that we can expand and collapse our nested json to focus in on what we're most interested in now let's start now the API we're going to use is this one from Coindesk. Now let's look at what we see at this URL. It's a very simple API call. It's gonna give us back the results in JSON. We don't need to pass any additional parameters in here. And remember, JSON is organized in key value pairs. Now the key will retrieve the value that's associated with that key. And the value is what's after the colon following the key. If you have the key, you can get its associated value. All of these keys are all wrapped in double quotes. So in this example here, the key disclaimer, spelled exactly as you see it here, no uppercase, will give us access to the value after the colon, this long disclaimer string here. Now the key chart name, again, exactly as you see here, no space, also important, this value happens to be lower camel case with a capital N, gives us access to the value, which is another string, Bitcoin. Now the key time gives us access to a value that's actually more key value pairs. And when a key gives you access to another level of JSON like this, this is sometimes referred to as nested JSON, meaning it's JSON inside of more JSON. Key value pairs inside of another key that refers to those key value pairs. Now the first three key value pairs inside of this key are updated, updated ISO, and updated UK. Now all three of these keys give us access to string values, and even though they look like dates and they can be converted to dates, we know that they're strings because the JSON value is wrapped in double quotes. Now, in terms of the JSON we want, we don't want most of this. We'll ignore time. We'll just assume that the time that we get is the most current exchange rate, and that's what we'll use. We also don't need the disclaimer or the chart name, but we will need three currency rates, and we've got to dig a little to get to those. So our results, everything we see here, give us access to all of the data on screen. But within this, we want to drill down first into BPI. This is nested JSON. That key gives us access to a bunch more key value pairs. Inside of BPI, we want to drill down into USD. Note that this is uppercase USD. It's very important that we refer to keys in the exact case value that you see in the JSON in the browser. It's all caps. This also gives us access to nested JSON. And inside of that, we want access to the key rate underscore float. And look at what that gives us back. No quotes, so this is a number, and it's got a decimal, so in Swift, we'll assign this value into a double. Now we see JSON values can include standard types like strings and doubles, also ints and bools, and some others that we don't see here. They can also include more key value types, nested JSON as we've mentioned above, and even though we don't see any arrays here, no square brackets, JSON values can also include arrays too, and we see those in our WeatherGift app, among other apps that we create. Now to get all the way into the rate float values, we're gonna create several data structures. First, the results data structure, which can potentially hold everything, but within that we'll specifically access BPI. Now that is gonna be a data structure that inside of it contains USD, and that data structure is gonna be one that gives us access to rate float, and inside that's gonna have a single property, which is gonna be a double. And that's what we'll assign to a property in this app that's gonna hold the currency conversion value US dollars per Bitcoin. So now once we can go through all of those and grab the rate that we want in US dollars, 
We can expand our data structure at the BPI level. We'll include GBP, which should access another data structure that we'll create called GBP struct, just like the USD struct, that gives us access to its own rate flow. And we'll create yet another data structure, EUR struct, which gives us access to the Euro rate flow. Now this number that we have here is so big, that's the number of US dollars per Bitcoin, pounds per Bitcoin, or euros per Bitcoin. And that just shows you that at the time that I'm recording this video, Bitcoins are very, very expensive. So in part four of this exercise, I've asked you to create a new class named currency rate, and it should hold double values in three properties named dollar per BTC, pound per BTC, and euro per BTC. I also give you a hint down here, you could offer an initializer if you want to, but I'd mention if you initialize those to 0, 0.0, then you can avoid having to create an initializer. Let's head back to Xcode. Let's create this class just below the scene delegate.swift. So I'll right click on scene delegate.swift, select new file. This is going to be a Swift file. Click next. I want to name this currency rate upper camel case because it's a class. So it's a type upper camel case is the convention. Click create. Then in this file, I'll define the class by saying class currency rate upper camel case open and close curlies. And now let's declare the three properties that we want. var dollar per BTC equals 0, 0.0, var pound per BTC equals 0, 0.0, and var euro per BTC equals 0, 0.0. Then in the next question, you're asked to use URL session and access Swift's native JSON parsing capabilities to put the correct currency conversion values in those three properties we just created. And I offer you a hint down below saying, hey, we're going to need to drill into BPI, then USD, then rate underscore float. And I suggest printing it out using the view did load function in viewcontroller.swift, even though normally we don't want to print it out, rather than to go ahead and work on all the user interface stuff, we want to make sure that the JSON is working. So before we even write any of the data structures we need for access, let's write the skeleton of our get data function. And it's going to work very similar to the previous get data functions that we wrote that access and parse JSON that we can get through just a single URL. So inside of currency rate.swift, we'll say func get data. And then inside of our open parentheses, we'll say completed colon. Remember, we're going to write a trailing closure after get data, which says, hey, we can execute the stuff after our call of get data after we hit this completed flag. So after the colon, we say at escaping, then open and close parentheses, arrows, open and close parentheses, then open and close curlies, and we'll write the body of the function. Now the bulk of this get data function is identical to functions that we've written before, but I'll rewrite it here. The first thing we'll do is we'll set up a string called URL string. So we'll say let URL string equal a pair of double quotes, and I'll copy the exact URL that we want to be getting through URL session, paste it back over into currency rate.swift. Then this next part isn't necessary, but I always like to print out to the console the URL that I'm accessing. So I'll say print, and then in quotes, we are accessing the URL string interp, URL string, and I'll put the web emoji just up front so it's easy to recognize in the console. Next up, we need to create a URL. That's a special data structure in iOS. So we're going to say guard let lowercase URL equals uppercase URL. That's to create this data structure. Now with open parentheses, the option that we want is down here with this one string. We'll press return to accept this, I'm going to put our URL string inside. That's what we're passing in. Else, open and close curlies. The guard let will let us pass through if this URL open paren string creates a valid URL. But if it can't, then we're going to get a nil. That means we haven't passed our guard test. That means we've got a return. So we'll just say print error could not create a URL from string interp URL string. And we'll put angry emoji out front for easy recognition in the console. But hopefully you'll never see this guy. And we'll return. But we also just before that want to put in our completed flag. So we'll say completed open and close parens. We also could have said completed on the same line as return just after return. Next up, we'll create a temporary constant that points to the URL session. It just makes our code a little tighter. So we'll say let session equals URL session dot shared. And then below that, what we want to do is get data with the data task method. Now we'll do this by creating a session task. So we'll create a constant to hold that. We'll say let task equals session dot data task open parens. You get a bunch of different options in here. We want this option that you see that has a completion handler. Now there's another one below this that you pass in a URL request. We don't want that. We want the one where we're passing in just the URL. This is going to return for us the potential of three values, although some of them might be nil, a data, a URL response, an error option. So press return to accept that one. 
it should look like this with code completion. The first thing we want to pass in here is going to be the URL. That's just lowercase URL. See, we created it up here with our guard let statement. So I'll paste that in, lowercase URL. Then I'm going to double click on the completion handler, which gives me the trailing closure style that I like so much. And for data, we'll call that lowercase data. For URL response, we'll call that lowercase URL response. And for error, we'll call that lowercase error. First, let's deal with the error. So we'll say if let error equals error, that means that we don't have a nil inside of error, open and close curlies. And for brevity, I'll just copy and paste the error statement that I had up in my guard let, but we'll change this so that it reads error, string interp, error.localized description. Now we can ignore the response, but we'll deal with the data that we get back here. And we do that inside of a do catch clause because the statement that's gonna convert the data into JSON using a JSON decoder is going to use a try statement, which will potentially throw an error. Remember, if we throw an error, we need to be inside of a do catch. So we say do open and close curlies, catch open and close curlies. And now our try statement is always within our do curlies. So we'll say let result equals try JSON decoder, open and close parens, dot decode. You wanna select this option right here where we're gonna pass in a type from data and this throws. So hopefully this will never throw an error and we'll never end up in catch, but we've gotta have that contingency planned for. So that's why we put it inside of the do portion of a do catch clause. Now we need to pass in the type that we're decoding the data into. So the data goes from into something we can decode into a valid type. Now, this could be any of the standard Swift types like string or double, but here we're gonna specifically use a set of data structures that's gonna let us drill down into the result, then find the BPI, then the USD, then the rate float. So when I write nested JSON, I actually find it useful to work backwards. So start inside the nested level that I wanna access and then build out my data structures back from there. So what I wanna end up with is the value associated with the key rate underscore float, which should be inside USD, which should be inside BPI, which is inside of my overall results that I'm getting from JSON. So back in currency rate.swift, the value that I wanna end up with is var, rate underscore float colon double. Remember, you're getting a double back and rate underscore float has to be written exactly as the key appears in the return JSON as we saw it on the web. Now I wanna put this inside of a data structure that I'm going to use to return our USD value. So I'm gonna call this private struct. I could name this anything that I want, but I'm gonna call it USD struct colon, it has to be codable. Anything you decode using a JSON decoder has to have the colon codable after it. Open and close curlies. Then I'll just cut out this var rate float that I created and paste it inside this data structure. Now, if we take a look, how do we get the key value pair rate float? Well, we access that via a key named capital U, capital S, capital D. And that's gonna be inside of a BPI structure. So we'll create another structure up here. We'll say private struct. We can say capital BPI because we don't wanna use the same lowercase BPI. So that's the name of the key. And we don't want our struct to have the same name as the key. Then colon codable, open and close parens. It's gotta be codable to be decoded. Then we need one property inside. We'll say var, capital U, capital S, capital D, because the variables inside of our structures have to have the exact same name as the keys in our JSON. This will be colon, and the type for USD is USD struct. So now that we've created a struct BPI, we need to create the value that is gonna hold the BPI struct, and that should be inside another structure that's gonna hold all of our results and we'll just call that result. So in currency rate.swift, we say private struct capital result colon codable open and close curlies. And what we have here is one property var lowercase bpi, the same spelling as we have in our JSON colon uppercase bpi, which is the struct we just defined below. So now we're all set with our results. We can get into bpi, we can get into USD, we can get into rate underscore float. So now we can decode capital result and we'll be able to drill down and access everything that we created to get to the rate underscore float value. So I'll clean up some of this extra space. We'll head down into our do clause and we're gonna decode to capital result dot self. So that means this result data structure is what we should take the data and squeeze it into. And since it's codable, and since it's structured exactly like the JSON, we'll be able to do this. 
and so we're decoding the data into result.self's format from, so the from will be data, exclamation point. Now we could have tested to make sure that we have non-nil in data, but if we got past the error, we should have something using this API. So force unwrapping that should be okay. Now on the line below, just to make sure that we're decoding this JSON okay, I'm gonna say print, and then in double quotes, I'll do triple star, result, string interp, and then inside, the way that I drill down is by using dot notation. So I'll say result.bpi.usd.rate underscore float. See how this form sort of steps to go down our nested JSON. Now we've got nothing named result, but that's the thing that holds everything. Then we have this BPI spelled the same way, USD spelled the same way, rate underscore float spelled the same way. And inside of catch, let's just acknowledge that error. So I'll copy the error from up here, paste it in between the catch curlies. And in the text here, I'll say error colon trying to decode JSON. Then we want to make sure that we have completed, which is our completed flag, open and close parens right after that. That will tell our get data function when we call it that it's okay to execute the trailing closure that's in the curly braces after we call get data. We'll see that in just a bit. And here is the ultra important piece that's so important to remember, and it's so frustrating if you forget to do this. We have to say underneath this task dot resume open and close parentheses. If we don't, then we're not running our task and we're not going to get our results and make sure that you place this in the right space. There should be two curlies after the task.resume. And now we're gonna head over to viewcontroller.swift because we need to create an instance of currency rate so we can call its getData method to get the data. So in viewcontroller.swift, declare var, lower camel case currency rate equals upper camel case currency rate, open and close parens. Then down in viewed load, currency rate dot get data, press return. We get a closure in there, just put print called successfully. Let's build and run. It looks like our interface is just a little bit off. We can fix that in a bit, but we see down in the console it says called successfully and we get a result of 8770.0688. Yours might be slightly different depending on the current US dollar to Bitcoin rate, but this works great. Now, just to give myself a little bit more room for the user interface, I'm gonna go over to main storyboard and I'm gonna shrink the taco. So I'll click on the taco. I've got my attribute inspector set up, but let me expand under the taco to take a look at the constraints. I'm gonna click on the height constraint. I'm gonna set that to 75. That looks good. What if I build and run? How does that look? Tight in the bottom, but good enough. It's not clear to me why my user interface on the main storyboard isn't matching to what's being shown in the simulator, but this is fine for the learning objectives in this app. So now that we've got our currency rate for US dollars, we also need to get pound and euro. So let's head back over to our currency rate class. And first, let's take a look again at our JSON. So if we see how we got US dollar under BPI, we had a US dollar and we accessed the key USD and we created a struct for that. And then we got our rate underscore float there. Well, we should be able to repeat what we did with USD for Great Britain pound and for the euro as well. So let's do that. Let's head back over to currency rate.swift and I'm actually gonna copy the structure that I created USD struct and I'm gonna paste it down below. Then I'm gonna change the name of the second one to GBP struct and pasting in the third one, I'm gonna change that to EUR struct for Euro struct. And then I'm just gonna create two more properties of the BPI class. I'll copy the variable USD line that I have right here and then I'll paste it twice below and then I'll change my var USD to GBP for Great Britain Pound, and this last property to EUR for Euro. Changing the two types in here to GBP struct and EUR struct respectively. So now if we take a look at our JSON, we are mimicking in the structs that we created inside of our currency rate class. The same thing that we see in JSON with all of our properties given the same names that we have in the keys here. Nice! Now let's scroll down to our do catch loop right after where we decode our JSON and we'll modify our print line here. So in addition to having this string interp result BPI USD rate float, we'll say comma and then just paste in two more copies of that string interp here, converting the second one to GBP and the third one to EUR, just so we can verify we're getting those three different results. Then on the line below this, this is where we'll take those values that we're getting from our JSON in our private struct and assign those to the properties of this class. So we'll say self dot dollar per BTC equals, and I'll copy and paste the result BPI USD rate float paste it in down here. I'll do the same for self.pound per BTC and self.euro per BTC, taking the right GBP rate flow and the right EUR rate float. So now I should have everything set up and exposed inside of my instance of current rate.swift when I run it from viewcontroller.swift. 
So congratulations on getting this far. We made an API call with the URL session, we grabbed the data, we created custom data structures and decoded the JSON, and we now have the currency rates for US dollars per Bitcoin, Great Britain pound per Bitcoin, and Euro per Bitcoin. So in the next video, we'll use these values to calculate the current bill and also convert it to Bitcoin.